Hi, I'm Dr. Christopher Newman. I'm Professor of Space Law and Policy at the University of Northumbria in Newcastle in the United Kingdom. I'm also International Space Law Advisor for Coal Star Technologies. I'm Ken Eppens, Founder and CEO of Orbit Guardians. I'm Robbie Boundy, Founder of Space Impulse. I listen to the Cold Star Project. And I listen to the Cold Star Project. And I listen to the Cold Star Project. All these people are crucial in order to have a successful business. And this is something that I found that nobody really talks about. Nobody really mentions their, their attorney or, or maybe they, they have crappy attorneys. I mean, we, we have an attorney who is just absolutely amazing. And through him, we actually understood that gathering people around you who support you, who share your vision are the most, most important uh, things for an early stage founder. <laughs> Welcome back to the Cold Star Project. I'm Jason Kattegat, your host. I'm here with Istvan Lurinst. He is the co-founder of Morpheus Space. This is the Cold Star Project. It is a space show, yes, but it's also about uh, the startup and, and growth, the unexpected challenges of growing businesses. And he's had a really great story. In fact, we've been Okay, so those of you who know my numbering system for the Cold Star Project, uh, we're on like 160 something now for interviews of that. His number is 68. So we, we have pushed this back many times because uh, he kept waiting for something to happen, which we're going to talk about, which is really, really important and key. And I'm glad we did. We had a great talk a couple of days ago to kind of warm up for this. Uh, and find out the reason why. Let's talk about, Istvan, the, the reality of creating a space startup. I really want to have folks like you on to communicate to proto-founders, I guess, if you will, people who are running around with a, an idea for a space business in their head, just what they're about to get into here, right? It's not all, um, you know, sunshine and roses. Let's, let's talk about your fundraising efforts and that journey. What, by the way, where are you at? What's the announcement? Ah, okay. So first of all, thanks for uh, inviting me. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, again uh, a, a pleasure to be on on your show, and uh, I'm happy that uh, I could I could uh, make it work mm -hmm. <laughs> after so <laughs> me too. many delays. Um, okay, so where are we at right now? So um, I'm the co-founder of of a space company called Morpheus Space. We produce the world's smallest and most efficient propulsion, electric propulsion systems for satellites. And we are at the stage where we closed our first private uh, funding round and we are now uh, growing and, and scaling the business, yeah. Awesome. So tell us about that process. Uh, what did you have to do and how long, obviously it took a while, how long did it take? These things always yeah. take longer than you think they will. Everything does. Yeah. So essentially our business is kind of unusual uh, in, in the sense of, of startups. Uh, we are a spin-off of a university. Right? Mm. And that means that our core technology was developed during long and tedious years of uh, academic research. So it's, it's not like, oh, I have an idea and I run to the VCs and get mm -hmm. some funding and do something with that. No, we, we actually uh, uh, worked a yeah, long time. Daniel, uh, the CEO and my co-founder, um, started the development of the technology almost a decade ago as, as an undergrad student. And then he moved into... Um, moved up the, the academic uh, career ladder, so to say. And, and we, we ended up in the same office as um, lecturers, assistant professors, and, and PhD candidates. And then, um, yeah, we, we had a, a lot of discussions about, about the technology and, and how we could uh, potentially bring it to market. But back then, um, small satellites weren't a big thing, right? Uh, new space was in its, in its uh, first uh, years, basically. So um, we kind of felt 
that this will be a big thing so that CubeSats and, and smaller satellites are, are going to uh, create uh, their own uh, market, so to say. And, and uh, that, that's where we wanted to, to place ourselves. We, we didn't want to um, create another contractor, right? Mm -hmm. that, that typical company that, that, um, that lives off uh, government contracts um, and, and uh, yeah, science missions. We wanted to make a real business. So, and, and that's, that's what we saw as, as the ideal op opportunity to become a new space company. And that's, that's uh, actually what we did. So once we, we were happy with the technology and we, we thought, okay, the, it, could, it could now work. Um, we were looking at uh, opportunities to get some funding to create a spin-off. Mm -hmm. And there, of course, you have multiple uh, choices. Uh, you can go to, to uh, private investors, angels or, or VCs and you can also um, search for government uh, grants, right? That focus on, on spin-off technologies and enabling that, that's, uh, mm. that commercialization of, of academic research. And we were lucky that in Germany, there is, there is um, a very good program that has this one focus to, to bring the uh, technology that, that was developed in academia into the market. And we, we spent about the bigger part of a year to, to work on that proposal and to, to really work out our business plan and our projections and all those things that you uh, need for anyone who, who, who would uh, give you money for, for mm -hmm. your uh, business. And then we submitted and defended and uh, got the grant. Uh, and that, that was essentially our, our seed uh, round, hmm. so to say, our, our first investment with which we, we could um, hire the, the core team and um, um, prepare everything so that we can uh, found a company and, and go to market. Uh, at that time, we didn't have a company either. We, mm -hmm. we were just employed at the university and we were just, uh, yeah, working like normal academics. Hmm. In, in, this is interesting because, again, you're based in Europe. Uh, a lot of folks listen and watch from North America. In the United States, setting up a business is like, you know, 100 bucks, boom, you're done. <laughs> Let's go, right? You get your, your uh, tax ID number online and pay for some corporation and, and you're done. How much more difficult is it in Europe? Um, <laughs> as with everything, uh, Europe is, is a lot more um, cautious, conservative, uh, and, and makes bureaucratic things harder for, for you. So when you talk about Funding a company in the U.S. it's really easy. It, you can do it online, right? You just it's as you say a hundred bucks maybe. Um, in in Europe, I think the the minimum capital that you would need for a GmbH, which is which is a company that that gets taken seriously by anyone. Uh, there are other forms of incorporation, but this is the one that you want. Uh, you need. Uh, 25,000 euros as the, as, as the capital for the company. And on top of that, you need to pay all the different uh, bureaucratic processes and, and uh, the public notary and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's a long process and, and it, it, it also costs a lot. So there we invested our own um, funds and, and mm. uh, created the company. Mm. So yes, more challenging than, uh, than <laughs> folks might think over here. It's just, oh, you just go do it. No, <laughs> you've got to have well, a, a bit we more really set have up. really to think it, yeah. think it through and, and, uh, and make, make the right decisions. And mm -hmm. at the end, it turned out that we, uh, and, and this is a funny story. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, we founded the company in the middle of the, of the, 
of the grant, right? Mm. Because the grant is, is a project, is, is a university project that goes on uh, from one and a half years to two years. And uh, it is designed in a way that at the end of the program, you found, found the company. But we decided to found the company sooner because we wanted to be able to submit a proposal to ESA hmm. to get uh, a, a nice starting off kickoff project and then build up relationships and, and stuff like that. And they had an ideal project, hmm. uh, um, a request for proposals. Um, where they actually wanted this little thingy here huh. that you can see here. We, we had this already and they wanted this. And uh, we submitted a proposal and uh, for that we needed to create the company. So that's, that's why we, we had to uh, um, yeah, be more early than, than usual. And at the end we didn't get the contract. So we were quite bummed out mm -hmm. and uh, after, after the project uh, ended and also during the project, we, we had to work on, on fundraising, the, the usual, uh, to get uh, VC funding, um, our, our first um, private money, right? Hmm. And it turned out that we actually are not the ideal company for the European mindset. Uh, that the investors have here. Um, our vision, our goals, our ambitions were just, and, and I'm not talking about every European investor, but the, the bigger ma majority mm. of, of them um, reacted in a very strange way, what we didn't expect. Uh, they always wanted to um, poke around in our business model, to change mm -hmm. our vision, to, mm -hmm. to push our expectations down, down, to make it more uh, safe, mm -hmm. I, I guess, because here security, safety is, is a higher priority than, than uh, gain and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, vision. So we decided that Europe is, is not really the environment where we need to do our fundraising. And then we, we searched for opportunities to get into the um, US environment mm -hmm. because we knew that once we get there, once we, can, once we could meet people face to face because calls are okay, mm -hmm. but it's not the same. You cannot transmit energy. You cannot transmit really the, the vision, your, your, your drive for, for that. So you need really uh, in-person meetings. And we found, um, actually, no, they found us. So mm. um, Techstar Starburst uh, Space Accelerator found us mm -hmm. in, in 2019. And um, we had a couple of calls and it was really, this is a, another interesting story about hard decisions again. Mm. Um, when, when the Techstars team reached out and they basically invited us to participate in the, in the selection process, right? We were quite, far along with one German investor. Hmm. And it looked promising, okay? It looked promising because even though we knew this, uh, this conflict of, of, of uh, culture um, between us and, and the European hmm. uh, investors, we, we didn't stop. We, we said, well, we, in order to win the lottery, you need to play the lottery. So we just continued. <laughs> and... Um, so we were far along with that one investor and, and we went to, to the investor and, and told them, hey, uh, this is what's up. They, they reached out, Techstars reached out and, and they want to invite us to the US and they want us to, to participate in the program and what do you think and how would that in, uh, impact your decision and, and stuff like that. And essentially um, we, we, we had long conversations about this 
but at the end it came out that they were against it mm. again mm -hmm. a thing why? that yeah. why i mean yeah. i understand that it's accelerators you always you, they get value right they mm. they they get something from the company mm -hmm. and they might argue that but what you get out of it especially when you when you are introduced in a mm -hmm. completely new marketplace, you are connected with important people who, who bring business to you, right? It's, it's worth it. That basically um, was our last draw where we said, okay, um, we are stopping this. And um, yeah, we just decided, okay, we are, we are gonna go ahead and give our best to get selected and uh, accepted to um, into the program, the Texas program. And we did it. So that was that was interesting, the, the process process itself, but that's that's a completely different story. Um, and we took the chance and said, well, we are going to move to the US uh, for for the duration of the program, which was about four months. Um, which is a huge commitment. I mean, um, Daniel has, has, has a family. Uh, uh, he had a, a, a newly born daughter. Uh, it, was, it was a hard decision. It was, don't, don't misunderstand that. So as a group, you physically got on a plane and flew over here? Uh, right. We both did. So yeah. me and, okay. and Daniel and ah, I did. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. The rest of the of the of the group stayed and and continued working on on our products. And then um, we did it. So we we arrived um, in the U.S. and I mean after a few weeks we already we have we have been introduced to a lot of lot of interesting people that are. Um, connected to, mm -hmm. to the business, uh, to, the, to the market. And uh, we, we knew that this was really the, the right decision. The, the, the other problem was again, that we, we already had a German company. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you do with that? And how do you get US investors into a, a European company, mm -hmm. which is not really something that an investor in the US wants mm. because it has a lot of complications. Let's just say that. Mm -hmm. So they, they tend to first off just say no. Oh, well, you're a European company. Well, mm, sorry, go to Europe and, and uh, try to get money from, from there. So um, these were the first reactions that we got from investors. And then we decided, well, we are not going to tell them that we have a German company, we are gonna uh, make it as if we, we would have a, a, a US company. And uh, during the process, we would then figure out the details and mm -hmm. make it somehow. And that's, that's the other part of the story that um, you, you're not just connecting to customers or uh, uh, investors, but also um, supporters mm -hmm. in, in, in every aspect of, of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. um, attorneys, um, various consultants, bookkeepers, all these, all these uh, people uh, are crucial in order to have a successful business. And this is something that I found that nobody really talks about, you mm. know? Mm -hmm. It's nobody really mentions their, their attorney or, or maybe mm. they, they have crappy attorneys. I mean, we, we have an attorney that is, who is, who is just absolutely amazing. Mm. And through him, we actually understood that gathering people around you that mm -hmm who support you, who, who share your vision are the most, most important uh, things for an early stage founder. 
This is Jason Gannigan from Cold Star Tech, and I'm excited to share with you a new offer from Cold Star that we are bringing out to help both space founders and venture capitalists who fund space companies. And it's on two levels. The lower level is a VC who is looking at possibly funding a space company, but they just don't get it. Right? And a lot of tech founders want to come out and create some sort of technical capability, but they do not understand business. And so you'll look and you'll go, where's the customer here? Where's the business model? And they'll go, huh? But I want to make rockets or something, right? And, and it's really cool. Well, that, as we know from the dot-com era, is not a viable business model. And so you bring us in. We've got great technical expertise on the space side. Folks who have done this sort of assessment before, like our technical engineering advisor, Dr. Rick Fleeter, myself in the process engineering field, plenty of other people <laughs> with brains to look at this problem so that you don't have to blow your brains out trying to figure out how to make this work. And on the company side... It's a benefit for them because we will show them the roadmap to how you're going to get funded, how, how you will want to fund them, what changes to make to get VCs excited about putting money in. And so that's good for you. Right? The second level is at a, a deeper and higher level at the same time. It is for venture capitalists who have uh, given a seed round to a company a space company, and that has gone on for a little while, six months, a year, something like that, and it is time, as uh, COVID has made it, to double down or get out. Those are pretty much the choices, right? It's time to invest further in a thing we already know, which seems to be the direction VCs are going in right now. Uh, they don't seem to want to look at new things uh, or, or stop, just kill the project. And so the good news is, in that situation, there's a lot more going on. There's more meat for Cold Star experts to get in and, and analyze, right? You're going to have processes in place, whether they know it or not. We'll be able to flowchart those and, and maybe accurately document them for the first time so we can get some kind of value chain going in the organization. We'll be able to test whether the leadership is the right group of people or whether you're missing something, the strategic direction, the business model, all this stuff. So... If this sounds interesting to you, reach out to us. You can email me at jason at coldstartech.com or just connect with me and message me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best way to do it. And uh, I am excited to talk to you. The, the kind of transformation that we're able to offer here is beyond anything you'll see out there. And as a VC, this will save you so much time and energy, right? Like if you're a VC and you've got 100 companies to look at, you've got three days a year. <laughs> to, to look at each one maybe, right? That's not really good enough, is it? Wouldn't it be better to have uh, experienced, expert space, people who understand space, right? Look at this investment and tell you, here's a grade, right? Here are several grade areas. Is this thing ready to pour gasoline on the fire or is it just going to go up in smoke? This is Jason Kanig from Cold Star Tech. Let's get back to the interview. It, it is always good to have 10 people telling the person that you're ac you need the money from or the decision from, oh yeah, yeah, I know this guy. I know this is fun, he's a good guy. I like their idea, yeah. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> I do a lot of work on that side of things myself, but I don't talk about it, it's true. Um, hmm, not because I don't want people to realize what I'm doing, but it just, it, it, hmm, it's never bubbled up to the surface as like, uh, hey, this yeah, is an important it's, thing. It's so, interesting. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, but it's clearly a very important uh, part of, of, doing, of, of building a business. Mm -hmm. they, yeah, because I, I know a lot of founders. Is, so Go ahead. So everybody says that networking is, is super important. Mm -hmm but nobody defines what networking mm -hmm. is. Everybody would, would just think, well, networking is all about finding investors or finding customers, but it's n n no. Mm -hmm. no. Networking is all about focusing on people, gathering people who support your vision, mm -hmm. whether they are investors or they are, I don't know, facility uh, managers, you know, it doesn't matter. You need people who support your vision because mm -hmm. Everybody else is going to tell you that you're going to fail and don't do this and don't do <laughs> yeah. that. So when that happens, you need, you need to, uh, uh, a network that supports you and, and, and picks you up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's how I got the advisors that I've got working with us at Cold Star. It's purely through networking and getting to meet them, talking to them. Uh, and they are, <laughs> they are lawyers, they are insurance people, they are the, maybe the boring side of the business or whatever. Um, you know, I don't need them to bring money to the table, but uh, yeah. 
it is darn helpful when I get down and uh, I can have a call with one of them and they can bring me back up again and say, oh, yeah, yeah you're on the right track. Um, yeah, you see, that's, yeah. that's what I mean. Yeah. That's, that's, that's something that people should talk more about and, and should write blogs and, you know. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, I will, I will have a think about that and see what, uh, what sort of content could be made in, in that idea. Let's talk about, um, th there's sort of a tug of war going on while you do not have a finished product. You've got an unfinished product. It's an idea, you've put some effort into it. There is a physical or mechanical thing there, but you need a customer and funding. There's this like tug of war, chicken or egg thing going on. How, how yeah. and like now what? How did you handle that? Um, especially coming to the, the States and not knowing anybody and starting to get introduced around um, yeah. and thanks to Techstars. We were in a very unique position, hmm. which I know that most startups are not in, which is we had our products already finished and they were already in space, mm -hmm. which was already hmm. uh, uh, an astonishing feat of, of uh, Daniel, actually. I had uh, very little to do with that. So I cannot talk about that from the perspective of, of Morpheus Space because we, we already had discussions where we could basically show the, the finished product. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. this is the finished product. There mm -hmm. you go, take a look at it, this is in space. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's quite a different conversation. But um, when you do not have the finished product, what do you do then? And, and we are uh, definitely in, in situations similar to that because we are, uh, of course, constantly improving and, and uh, creating new products, new services. And you need to be able to talk about your, your product that is not finished as if it would be finished, as if mm. it would already be done and, and, and functioning, but without actually lying, because mm -hmm. that's, that's an absolute no-go. If someone catches you in, in, in the, uh, the investor side or the customer side that you're lying, that you're out. Yeah. So don't, don't do that, right? But you need to convey what your product does in such a convincing way that you already believe that that is already there, then nobody will question the existence of it. Mm. And that is the, that is the, the art of, of, of sales, right? Convincing people that, that what, what you believe. Mm. Okay. So that's, so that's my advice about yeah. that. Yeah. So get clarity on that end result and really put energy into expressing yeah. that when you're in front of these folks uh, so that they can kind of, uh, catch the bug <laughs> and then be, exactly. you know, duplicate exactly. that idea in their head and then they go oh well obviously that's, I'm gonna fund this thing yeah, and that's that's yeah. that's something that is very uh, usual in on the US side which is uh, people tend to focus more on on your um, energy on your en enthusiasm uh, before they start to doubt right mm. so if you're kind of shy and, and uncertain about yourself, they, they start to think about doubts. Oh, mm -hmm. is it really that? Or does it really do that? Or is it really as good as, as, as he says? And that can even happen if you already have the finished product, right? So you need to, you need to be always enthusiastic about, about your, your thing that you're doing. Okay, let's move to values. On your LinkedIn profile, you, you talk about the intention of actively shaping the future of aerospace. What does that mean to you? And what, what does it mean you end up taking action on? Um, to be honest, I wrote that sentence before I, um, before I founded the company, right? Mm -hmm. To which, uh, it was more like an intention mm. <laughs> and then the intention became a reality. So essentially, um, as, as a new space startup, you have not just the right, but basically the obligation of, of playing your part in forming the, the new industry, 
forming a new market, creating new values, creating mm -hmm. new regulations, new mentalities. And that is what I mean by that, that we, we need to be uh, very active in spreading uh, the information about, for example, uh, space debris. Uh, not a lot of people know about that issue. Hmm. We can we can essentially screw up our uh, Earth orbit environment in a way where we cannot use satellites for for decades, right? And and that's just one example. Other examples are more bureaucratic. Like um, I want to be able to to um, have every satellite avoid collisions or have every satellite essentially have the capability to move around in space. And how do you do that? How do you, you, you think about it? How do you influence the, the, the industry to, to adapt something that, is, that brings a little bit more risk to their mission, that increases their cost? So, you think about how do you actually achieve that without going to those people and, and, and talking to them until they are just tired of hearing your voice. Mm -hmm. And there you, you get uh, innovative ideas like, oh, well, I, I might go to the insurance companies and then mm -hmm. I could basically convince them that if they, if your clients adapt these products, then the risk of, of failure is actually lower or, or the things like that. And, and that is, that is act actively shaping the, the industry. All right. Who, who is your target customer now uh, with the electric propulsion system? Okay. Um, essentially, uh, satellite operators and satellite builders, right? Mm -hmm. So we try to engage with uh, uh, these companies as as soon as possible, so that we can um, we can show them our full range of uh, capabilities that that the technology unlocks, so that they can adapt the mentality to their missions. Because um, we try to um, also show the the industry that with highly efficient propulsion systems, you can actually achieve new business models. You just need a few tricks here and there, but the core thing is to have that hardware on, on board, right? And, and once you have that hardware on board, uh, you can then attach uh, some form of, of operation service that, that basically uh, eases your job of, of um, for example, rearranging your satellites or, or finding new markets for, for your constellation, for example, that is already fixed out there. So yeah, things like, things like that. All right. Long ago, <laughs> in the beginning time, when I started uh, the space, uh, like season two of this show, I had the team lead for Airbus's electric propulsion department on, uh, and he explained what it was and how it worked and that kind of thing. Um, there is a mission profile that this is more suitable for, right? It takes a while for the electric propulsion to get going, right? It's, it's, it's um, very good for longer missions than that, right? Yes. Um, yeah. or, or argue with me. <laughs> you know? um, so, so it's not, it can't be every single satellite manufacturer. Uh, however, they should know that this exists and that. Um, what, are there any barriers to user adoption for your technology? If, is there something that if it was just whisked away, oh, it's gone now, uh, people would come rushing? Um, of course. Yeah, of course. okay. Of course, so you cannot really apply electric propulsion to every need. Mm -hmm. That is that is just not possible because of the limitations that you mentioned, which essentially comes from the 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 low thrust capability mm -hmm. of every uh, electric propulsion system. Um, so, in in those cases where where you need to uh, make fast maneuvers, where you need to, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm I'm gonna be very scientific here and, and say where you want to make Hochman Hochman transfers. Uh, which is basically a jump in orbit, 
electric propulsion system spiral up, mm -hmm. right? And, and if you have a chemical, a high thrust propulsion system, it, it basically jumps in, in, in orbital energy. So that, that is one uh, very uh, different scenario where, where if, they, if the customer says, well, I need to transfer my satellite from GTO to GO in, in a week or in a day or whatever, then you say, well, okay, thanks. <laughs> Right, it's we, not we a fit. We cannot do yeah. anything. It's yeah. it's not a fit. Um, but I would say that the in the majority of the cases where electric propulsion does make sense, right? Um, in those cases, the barrier the, that we battle most with is the new mentality that we bring to the table, which is modularity, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. we have created a product that that is mass producible mm. and this is something you don't talk about in the space industry mm. and mm -hmm. you know 20 years ago every bolt was custom yeah. made everything yeah. was custom you didn't use mass production uh, uh, techniques right so this was one of the one of the um, visionary ideas that that mm. Daniel had that okay we should we should miniaturize it, but in a way that it is mass producible. So not having very special little thingies that need months in, in production. So we created this product and now we offer it and tell the user that, well, you need to cluster a lot of them because this is the most optimal configuration for the propulsion system. And this is how it is. And it, it is actually good for you because it lowers cost and it increases your, um, um, it decreases your, your chances to failure, mm -hmm. right? Because you have a lot of sm individual small elements and if one fails, I mean, if you have a hundred, you barely notice it, right? <laughs> and and that, is, that is sometimes a, a big challenge to, push the people over the edge to accept mm -hmm. that, oh, well, I'm going to integrate a hundred propulsion systems into my satellites where people come from, from an era where they actually designed their satellite around the whole propulsion system because it was so complicated and mm -hmm. had so many components. Ours is like a brick, right. you know, it's just right. threw it on and you have one connector and that's all. Okay, and I have run into this myself. Uh, my whole reason for entering the space industry was to provide uh, manufacturing process improvement services for uh, folks who were doing satellite manufacturing who had been in that onesie twosie job shop mentality and wanting to go to a more Toyota style lean manufacturing, continuous manufacturing process. And uh, yeah, it's been tough <laughs> on that end. Right? Yeah. That is, that I, you know, people are not beating down my door to talk to me about that kind of thing, um, which is a little frustrating because we have a lot to give in that area. Uh, I'm imagining with, with your system there, um, it doesn't need a fuel supply, right? So there's no need for a big canister of uh, chemical it fuel. Need fuel. Yeah, it, it needs something, need. yes, it has, but it has probably not as big it as a it chemical tank. It is actually integrated into the propulsion system. So the, the mm -hmm. propellant is inside. That's it's in that box, see. yeah. It's in that box, yes. Right. Um, so it's, <laughs> that's going to be better. Um, how is it on, on launch? Um, it looks pretty solid state. Uh, does the vibration have a chance of doing anything really to it or is it, is it pretty solid? Uh, that's uh, funny that you ask uh, because <laughs> we today ha we had uh, the, a visit from a company that provides the software for vibration tables. <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. that's why it's <laughs> so we are actually um, um, setting up uh, our own facility where we can uh, validate every single delivered propulsion system against uh, any type of, of um, launcher, right? Every launcher has its own vibration profile and we can just uh, do that. But as far as, as uh, we know until now, um, 
the propulsion system has been tested on, on, vib on vibration tables and mm -hmm. it was qualified for, for a Soyuz launch and mm -hmm. which is one, one of the more uh, stronger yeah. uh, uh, vibration uh, profiles. Um, so on, on, on that side, we are, we are quite well off. We don't, mm -hmm. we don't have any problems. So essentially from, from the launcher side or from the integrator side, this is a, a solid break of metal. The, the propellant yeah. is, is a metal which is inside mm -hmm. uh, enclosed. It's, yeah. It's, it's ready nothing, to go. Nothing. Yeah, it's ready to go. So okay. we don't see any problems. What, what's your capacity right now for manufacturing? If a if, uh, satellite manufacturer appeared and said, hey, I want a bunch of these, um, what does it look yeah. like? We don't really uh, release that information. Mm -hmm. What yeah. are, it's, it's like with McDonald's. If you go into a McDonald's and ask how many uh, hamburgers mm -hmm. they, they, can, they can make, uh, they won't tell you. <laughs> Um, we, we say that we can produce enough to, mm -hmm. to supply, uh, a, a big chunk of the market, uh, excluding the mega constellations because those are mm -hmm. their own. And I'm, I'm quite sure that they, they will need dedicated factories for mm -hmm. every single subsystem. So we, SpaceX tends to keep everything in house. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. yeah tends vertically integrate um okay well what's the next step for you and and for morpheus okay so right now we we are uh about finished with our new factory uh the office space uh is is now uh, a little construction site so walls are made and and the conference room and the, the all the uh, tables and, and stuff like that so um, growing the team, uh, hiring people, that's, that's what we do right mm. now. Um, we are, we are super happy that we got such an amazing group of, uh, investors who, who support us in every single way they can. And, um, basically we are, we are growing and, and that, that's our focus. Then uh, once the, the, the travel restrictions are lifted towards the US, um, we are uh, setting up a permanent office, uh, most probably in uh, LA, uh, because that's where the, the heart of, one of the hearts of aerospace is, if we want to be PC about it. Um, and, um, developing new products. So we are, we are actually um, creating new uh, software services and also an, up, an upgrade for the propulsion system. So our first upgrade to the propulsion system is going to be an autopilot. So basically mm -hmm. having the, the capability on the, the propulsion system itself to uh, make uh, autonomous maneuver. So the operator only has to specify the, the end orbit or the, the changes in, in certain orbital parameters and the propulsion six, uh, systems uh, um, take care of, of those maneuvers. And this, this will be then uh, platform agnostic. So, so that hmm. uh, basically you can integrate it in, in every satellite platform. Hmm. Okay. And yeah. And that's and, a software uh, software type product that's that's a firmware type yeah. product and okay. also a little bit of of uh, hardware uh, additions to the mm. to the propulsion system it depends on on um we will have some uh, variety in in the options um we will we will then release i, I don't want to talk about in detail mm -hmm. about them uh, we will then release come back when you're ready <laughs> we'll do, a, yeah, yeah, we'll do exactly. an update video right now yeah. right now we are we are working on 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 those and uh we we have a new uh, software uh, department where we are creating a web application where our customers can optimize their maneuvers they mm. can uh they can first of all see what the propulsion system is capable of because 
we cannot simply send a data sheet because it has so many control parameters and so many, uh, uh, such a vast uh, domain of uh, operation points that we cannot just show it in one line or, or a number. So we need a software uh, where they actually can define a maneuver or and the satellite and then uh, they get an optimized solution for that. Yeah, that's, that's, these are our uh, short-term goals this year. Cool. All right. Well, Istvan Lorenz, where can people find out more about you and, and Morpheus Space, connect with you? Um, they, can, they can look me up on LinkedIn. Uh, that's the easiest way. Mm -hmm. Look up Morpheus Space. Just Google Morpheus Space. You find most probably the, the homepage. The homepage has the uh, LinkedIn links, and then <laughs> you can find uh, all the the team members there and um yeah that's the best way to get in touch with me i'm i'm always on linkedin i love linkedin mm -hmm. I, i'm the biggest fan of it awesome I well i appreciate you doing this <laughs> yes that is yeah. where we yeah. uh, encountered each other thanks for doing this thank you very much Hey, this is Jason Canigan, the host of the program. Thanks a lot for listening to the Cold Star Project. If you want me to send you new episodes of the Cold Star Project so that you don't have to go hunting around for them or watching YouTube or anything like that, go to this page, coldstartech.com slash MSB. That's short for Make Space Boring, which is what we're all about. And uh, drop in your email address there, and I will be able to do that for you. Make Space Boring is another little show that I run. It's a shorter format, quick interviews, and uh, news of the day, and sometimes an update of who I'm meeting and what I'm learning in the space field. It's on the same Cold Star Tech channel. Speaking of which, on the YouTube channel, I can do something I cannot do on the audio-only version, which is add playlists. And so there may be topic area playlists on the YouTube channel that you would be interested in digging into and going down the rabbit hole and learning uh, more about. For example, space law and policy, space situational awareness, the lunar mining and construction and fun stuff like that. So go check that out. Uh, that is at coldstartech.com slash play. That's the short link to get there. Anyway, thanks for listening and I look forward to talking to you soon.